Welcome back to ThinkTech. This is Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the one o'clock block uh, with Dr. Michael DeWert. He's our chief scientist and he's been looking at, uh, gee, the infection and the epidemic, the pandemic since March. We've been following it, but it's worse now than it's ever been. Hi, Mike. Uh, I'm, I'm sad to yeah. have to ask you about this. <laughs> yeah, me too. I had expected we'd have rounded the corner in October, but no, it's getting worse. So, yeah. yeah, as you said, I've been follow I've been actually following this since February, um, and I uh, did make some. Well, like I said, we've been following since February, and uh, I saw in February how bad it was. So I like, scheduled all my elective surgeries, like my cataract surgery, before the shutdown happened, and uh, glad I did. Uh, but yeah, this is um, we're position where 47 million people in the world have had the disease. We've had, uh, we're going to hit 10 million people in the United States that have had the disease sometime in the next week. We've killed a quarter of a million people in the United States alone with this disease. And it's just, it's increasing. It's, the, the, rate of in, the rate of cases is actually increasing now. And it looked like it was going to flatten out back in September, but now we're back onto an exponential curve. The rate of doubling right now on that curve is every 10 weeks. Every 10 weeks, we'll Add, we'll double the number of people who've had the disease. So right now we'll hit 10 million people. And this week we're going to hit 20 million people by mid-January. Um, and that's, that is really sad because it's unnecessary. We could have um, taken aggressive measures to control the disease. Uh, had everybody hunker down like during the Great Depression, say we're all in this together. Let's pull together. Let's wear our masks. Let's social distance. Let's wash our hands. And uh, we could have greatly reduced the toll. And right now it's like the third leading cause of death in the United States. And that's going to just continue, um, if not get worse. Yeah. Well, it gets scary, Actually, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's scary when the government and the executive branch says we're not even gonna to try to control it anymore. Um, you know, we, we need to be slowing it down so that the, when the vaccine comes, we have a chance to get the vaccine to people in time to save their lives. Because uh, we're not going to have a vaccine widely distributed for at least a year. Even if they had the vaccine ready to go tomorrow, um, ramping up for manufacturing, distributing it, getting people vaccinated, we're, we're looking at at least a year from now. And that's a year more of agony and unnecessary death because we're not doing the stuff we need to do to control it. Now, in Hawaii, we had a scare back in August when we were up to 300 cases a day or so. Now we're at 80 cases a day. We're not on an exponential growth path right now. We're just increasing at 80 cases a day. Um, that could change once you let the tourists in, and we have a lot of people from the mainland seeding our aisles with this disease. We could go back to an exponential growth rate. Um, I hope that doesn't happen. Is we're in a, right now in a fortunate position where it's still manageable, where we're not overwhelming our healthcare system. There's places on the mainland where you know, hospitals are just full of COVID patients now, and places where they didn't expect it. In North and South Dakota now, the highest higher per capita rates than New York City did in the height of the pandemic, and that was largely because North and South Dakota decided they weren't going to try to control it. And, uh, I don't want to blame just one event, but the Sturgis motorcycle rally was a good example of an event where there were insufficient controls, insufficient social distancing and masking, and it seeded the disease all over the Dakotas and also other places. There's estimate I read that uh, at least 30,000 COVID-19 cases can be traced straight to the Sturgis motorcycle rally. And that's just one of many examples. Um, People need to realize that this is a contagious disease. The laws of nature don't care what your politics are. Um, a, a disease that is fatal will kill you no matter who you vote for. And uh, it could have been very different. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, it, what it, it establishes a few you know, basic, basic truths to go forward. Number one is you've got to have a, an active plan by government. Mm -hmm. This is not mm -hmm. something where, you know, the individual, even the individual community or, or city or state can, can handle yeah. it. You've got to have a national government actively involved. Don't you yeah. agree? Oh, I agree. And, and we, we could have had that. And I understood there's a, uh, 
there was an initiative at the post office to send two masks to every U.S. household. That would have sent the right message. And they quashed it for, I don't know, whatever reason. You know, um, I mean, they could have printed Donald Trump's name on the mask and said, stay safe. Donald Trump cares about you. And that would have sent the right message. Um, I don't know how it got to the position where masking is a political statement because it's just laws of nature. We want to be safe. We, we could have had, you know, if, you had seized, if, we had, if the government had seized the initiative early on to say, look, the Chinese screwed up. The Chinese made a mess of this. But we're the United States of America. We're the richest. We're the smartest. We're the best nation in the world. We can control this disease and show the rest of the world how it's done. And instead, it's Taiwanese, the South Koreans, and the Singaporeans, and the New Zealanders who are showing the rest of the world how it's done. And the United States is pitied, yeah. which is astonishing to me. It's not the country I grew up in. Yeah. Uh, we were the envy of the world, and now we're pitied by the world yeah. um, because of our inept response. Um, and it, like, it could have been different. It could have been so different, and it could have been different in a way that would make Donald Trump look like a hero. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, certainly he went reason, wrong. That's not the course we pursued. Yeah. He went wrong. He didn't. He didn't pursue a, a national initiative here. That's you right. know he right. he just never got there. He never actually got there. He was yeah. deflecting yeah. every every call for a national initiative, or right, right down to having the post office send masks to you. Um, and now yeah, he's, threatening, right. he's threatening to fire Fauci. I mean, really incredible yeah. things. Yeah, so given where we are, you know, where can we go? There, there, there are places where the disease is so prevalent that now contract tracing may not be possible. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, yeah. Hawaii is one of the places where we can still do contact tracing and still find the people who have been exposed to the disease and isolate them before they can spread it further. And there's a lot of places on the mainland U.S. where you can still do that. There may be a few where you can't, but there's no reason not to try. You know, we have the National Guard. We have a lot of money, a lot of resources. We just need to have a coherent, unified national plan to go do it. Um, you know, it's and you know, a Stalin. You know, when people were dying of starvation in Russia, said, "Eh, one death." One death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. And that seems to be the attitude. A million deaths is just a statistic. Um, I, I, yeah, like I said, that's not the country I thought I was living in. <laughs> I don't think people, um, I don't think people yeah. in yeah. general, even nice, yeah. you know, well-educated people fully understand the magnitude of a million deaths or even 250,000. Yeah. I mean, how long yeah. would you have to count? If we started counting now to 250,000, it would take us weeks to get there. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. and, and, and then yeah. people, you, they don't realize, I mean, I think some of the media makes an, an attempt to show us. So uh, I'm thinking of the news hour where they, they give you a little precise about you know, people who uh, have lost relatives and all that, mm -hmm. um, uh, about the experience <laughs> and the experience yeah. for the individual. Yeah. And for the family, it's it's gruesome, mm. and you know, yeah. and if you if you put mm. yourself on that spot, it's something like all of a sudden, you come up, you know, especially people who are compromised in some way, all of a sudden you come up with these mm. symptoms, you take a test, you find out you're positive, it gets worse, now you're in the hospital, and that's the last you see of your family. Bye. Yeah, all finished yeah, yeah. you know it's yeah. sliding under the waves it's sort of like that awful scene in uh, in orwell's 1984 where you march off to neverland and nobody ever sees you again mm, yeah. um, that's that's what we've got here yeah. nobody thinks about you yeah. uh, the other thing is um, you know i i'm i'm working on a theory here dead people don't vote if they had a chance to vote you know where they say yeah. history is told by the survivors Mm -hmm. and, and voting is done by the survivors. Yeah, but yeah. The, the, the virus doesn't care who you would have voted for. It will kill you no matter who you would have voted for. It's true. And, but, or cripple you no matter who. So it's scary almost as the death rate, the 1% to 2% death rate from this disease is the unknown long-term effects. Already in the Big Ten, they've had athletes, college athletes, young people who are testing positive for myocarditis after a bout with COVID. Myocarditis is a heart condition that can kill people. And we've got, you know, one in 200,000 athletes, young athletes, die of it every year anyway. 
which works out to a couple hundred athletes every year die in the United States as it is now without the COVID-19 induced myocarditis. Um, we can greatly, you know, that, that's not a lot of people may be dying of it, but the point is that every, anybody who gets myocarditis is cardiac compromised. You know, they will be, have shorter lives, they'll be more limited in what they can do, less productive at work. Then you've got the neurological effects long-term, you know, increases susceptibility for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I'm not sure how much yet, but that's going to be a hit to GDP when people, knowledge workers who get COVID can't be knowledge workers anymore. Um, that will take a big hit out of our gross domestic product. Um, it only takes a few percent to uh, slow our growth rate down to less than the third world countries or less than Europe, less than anybody who's controlling the disease. Um, we, we could have controlled the disease, and I think we still can. It's just going to take a lot more work now. Um, a couple, a couple of and, thoughts. And, on, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm just saying is that the, um, the like the long-term effects are are an unknown unknown. We're beginning to know it, and um, we we shouldn't be cavalier about this. And I can see a lot of cavalier attitude towards the long-term effects. Yeah, that's one of the uh, interesting things about uh, Trump's uh, ostensible recovery at Walter Reed, you know, all his experimental drugs and all the care and attention they gave him, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But, you know, he's, he's not really out of the woods. If you, if you yeah. go by uh, all the mm -hmm. medical findings on this, every time they look, they find some other long-term mm -hmm. effect of this disease. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, and what he was telling everybody is, oh, no, you get through the disease, you have no effects. Look at me. I'm really healthy. No problem. I yeah, did. yeah, yeah. You know, shed yeah. it off my shoulders. No problem. Yeah, and, and and it's nothing. Not really I survived cool. it. Right, right. He had the best care, ventilator support right away. He didn't wait a week, you know, to get health care the way a lot of Americans would have to. And, uh, and they, he touted this drug remesdivir. You know, it turned out the World Health Organization that statistically speaking, it's not a helpful drug. Um, there are no really helpful drugs so far. You know, hydroxychloroquine, you know, you wonder if they would have treated it with hydroxychloroquine and bleach injections, you know, what he wouldn't be saying now. But <laughs> um, the point is, there's no, every, every time we tout a new miracle drug to shorten the course of this disease, it fizzles out. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are no good drugs yet. Um, there's no vaccine yet. They keep putting vaccine trials on hold because of side effects. We don't know what the Russian vaccine really does. We don't know how effective it is because they're not releasing good controlled study statistics. So we're going to be waiting a while for a vaccine. And we need to control the disease. Otherwise, they're going to have, I mean, we're still in the first wave of this thing. I mean, we have not seen a first wave peak yet in the United, as the United States as a whole. Um, in the 1918 Spanish flu, we had no choice but to let the disease take its course. You know, we, we, had, we could do the quarantining, we could do the social distancing, and people got tired of it and ended up killing you know, several percent of the population, uh, which we're not there yet in the United States, but we're getting there. Um, and there's no excuse for it. We, we should have learned from 1918, and we should have learned from SARS. Um, and, well, we should have learned from just reading the newspaper. I yeah, mean, there's an yeah. extraordinary number of people in in the country that 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 consider the whole thing a hoax, and they consider mm -hmm. the uh, advice to wear a mask uh, inappropriate and wrong, and social mm -hmm. distancing the same thing. Then they go to Sturgis and other places. They go to his rallies, and the then the mm -hmm. ignorance is is pervasive. And what mm -hmm. strikes me is that um, he has educated. Trump has educated millions of people how to ignore the science and at their own risk. So the yeah. you know, interesting question is they, they ignore it in the name of the Constitution, in the name of civil rights and personal liberties. Uh, and they go and kidnap or try to kidnap the you know governor of Michigan over that. <clears throat> and there'll be more such. And the question really is, is where, I mean, uh, let's put him, uh, you know, out, out of history for a minute, um, which is where he belongs. Um, how much control should the government have on this? Uh, we attended a uh, program uh, by the Harvard Club where the ACLU spoke uh, on Friday. 
And <clears throat> very interesting. And so they, they consider it a balancing of the equities. And, you know, you don't want to force people to do things they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, there's an interest in making the community healthy, but there's a limit. There's a limit. And I'm saying to myself, oh, yeah. gee, that there's no limit as far as I'm concerned. If, if somebody mm -hmm. doesn't wear a mask, I'd put them in the slammer. Sorry. Uh, that, now, that's not mm -hmm. really a violation of, of the community civil rights, you know. Yeah, yeah well, it's been established, at least at the time of typhoid Mary, that the government does have the legal constitutional authority to quarantine people who are threats to the community because of a contagious disease. You know, and, and this was litigated with typhoid Mary. You know, She had lawyers who wanted to keep her from being quarantined and said, nope, you're a threat. We can quarantine you. And uh, that's not uh, an infringement of civil liberty. You know, if you are if you are contagious, carrying it like, even now, tuberculosis patients have to quarantine. It's just a law because tuberculosis is incredibly contagious, fatal disease. Um, and we've we've forgotten what it was like to have these pandemics. Like it used to be polio when I was a, a kid. My parents must have lived in terror of the summer polio epidemics that sweep the United States. Um, we used to have cholera epidemics. We used to have all kinds of things that we take for granted are gone now. Measles used to kill thousands of people a year. We, we have a vaccine now. And, you know, if you want to go out, go to a public school, you need to get vaccinated. And that's a well-established legal principle. No vaccine. You go to whatever school will take you, but it's not going to be the public school. Um, and I, private institutions are within their rights to require you to wear a mask, require you to social distance, require you to hand sanitize. That's not even a government issue. Um, so, you know, yeah. and it goes further, Mike. It goes, I mean, it goes further. Suppose, <clears throat> and this is maybe wishful thinking, but suppose in a year from now, um, the population in general, millions of Americans, have the opportunity to uh, to to take a vaccine. Uh, mm -hmm. There will be those who refuse. Um, sure. and I feel the same way about them. They they may <laughs> say they, they believe they are at risk, and and therefore yeah. you know or that some crazy thing is going to happen, like in the mm -hmm. in the uh, the case of the measles vaccination, uh, which was really not true, but some people got up yeah. and and uh, you know popularized yeah. the notion that it would get, lead to autism. I think um, that was a case of scientific fraud, actually. That was yes. out and out science. Fraud. Yes, yes. So the, 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 not, be we don't need to amplify that rumor anymore either. It's, that was just out and out scientific fraud. Yeah. And it gained a lot of publicity for the researcher who claimed it, and it um, turned out not to be true at all. He lost but his even if license. the vaccine has side effects, you have to look at the relative risks. You know, and maybe there is a low rate of side effect of the vaccine, and it has to be lower than the rate of threat from the disease. Um, uh, clearly with measles, polio, smallpox, all those diseases are so horrible in their, in their effects and their side effects that the vaccine's a much, much lower risk. Um, and that's, that's why we don't have polio now. And yeah. we're wiped out smallpox. You know? We don't have to have measles at all. We don't have to have measles. Um, and, and the same could be true of the COVID-19. You know, the worst case with COVID-19 would be People don't get vaccinated, and people who get sick don't retain immunity for the long term. And it could well be that it doesn't provoke a long-lasting immune response every six, maybe six months or so. If that's the case, then we'll have a wave of pandemic every two years, approximately. That's my simulation show. And, and the reaper will take his toll every time. And, and you'll be weakened with every bout of the COVID you get. So the people who are 30 and have some mild disease, I don't care, it's a mild disease. Well, now they're weaker because they've had cardio myocarditis from the disease or lung damage from the disease or neurological damage from the disease. And so the next time, a couple of years later, the wave comes around, they'll be vulnerable even worse. So let's hope the vaccine comes sooner rather than later. Let's hope the vaccine needs to only be given once, but it has to be given every year like the flu. Um, well, this disease is much worse than the flu. And so I get a flu vaccine every year. I would definitely get a COVID-19 vaccine every year. That's what it took to uh, stay away from this disease. So it's and an I interesting think, ethical yeah. question. 
<clears throat> so you say to somebody, uh, I want you to take the COVID um, vaccination because we, we want to stamp it out so that, you know, the community doesn't have any more infection. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's wrecking havoc on the community. So we want you to take it. Yeah. And the guy says, well, yeah, but, but I believe that I'm going to have side effects from, from the vaccine. And uh, so it's my right not to take it. That's an interesting legal question when you have a pandemic mm -hmm. and all these people, yeah. you know, millions and millions of mm -hmm. people, we've proven, it has been proven yeah. that uh, they're at risk. So what, you, what happens yeah. to this fellow who decides that I want to do it because, you know, I, I believe that the risk to me personally is greater than the risk to the community. Somebody has to yeah. decide mm -hmm. that. And I, you know, I think the government has yeah. to step in and say, no, you may have a risk. You may have side effects yeah. from the vaccine. You may even die from the vaccine, but we're talking about 300 million people. Mm -hmm. You have yeah. to help out. You have to yeah. take that risk. It has to be a very, the safest effective vaccine we can get. Um, the, risk, uh, the risk of dying from the vaccine has to be like one in millions <laughs> right. uh, for it to be acceptable. Right. And, and that's possible. It's probably possible to do that. Whether we can get it this year or next year is another question. But it's been well established that the public schools can say you must have your vaccinations before you go to school. The army can say you must have your vaccinations before you can join the army. The, 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 anybody who runs an organization can say, you know, you, if you want an organization, you have to be vaccinated. Hospitals do this routinely with doctors who deal with contagious diseases. You need to be vaccinated again if you're going to come to our hospital to work because we don't want you spreading the contagion. Um, uh, yeah, but what about the opera? This. What about the opera, Mike? You like the opera. What about the, the, the opera. Yeah. <laughs> What about going yeah. to a movie theater or, or even a restaurant? I would yeah. I would say you have to prove to me <clears throat> that you've taken the vaccine and you can't get in. You can't get into the opera, the symphony. You can't get into a movie theater yeah. or a restaurant for that matter. Well, those places could require legally that level of proof. They could require it. They're not the government. They could require you to show that you had your shots. That's not likely to happen, but if there's a contagious disease going around and people are passing around at the opera, the movie theater, the restaurants, people won't want to go to the opera, the movie theater, the restaurants. And um, society will either accept not having those things anymore or people will apply peer pressure to get everybody vaccinated. Um, there, yeah, it's hard to say. You no, know, I mean, the government could require you to have a vaccine. Um, you know, if you want to operate a motor vehicle, you got to get your shots first or something. I mean, it, it, yeah. If you want to go to public school, you got to get your shots. If you want to go to the DMV, you got to prove you had your shots before you can come in and renew your car license, something like that. Before you, I mean, the government buildings can require you to show you had your shots before you enter the government building. So you could do that. Yeah. Um, they should yeah. do that. Yeah, they should, don't they have should the make right. sure every, everybody takes the vaccine because that's the way you stamp it out. You know, yeah. I, the yeah, other you wanna... thing I wanted to, to talk mm -hmm. with you about is the, is, the, is the social psychology aspect. You know, until mm -hmm. now, we have a substantial number of people in the country that do not believe it's real and that do yeah. not believe, the, you know, in any of the scientific methodology for dealing yeah. with it, masks and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, social distancing, tracing, tracking, whatnot. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, if, mm -hmm. now if Trump loses this election tomorrow, hopefully, um, you know, we won't have any more irrational blame game things. But if he wins the election, mm -hmm. we will. I suspect that the first mm -hmm. thing he's gonna be looking for uh, are scapegoats who are at mm -hmm. fault for this. I mean, he's- Oh, he'll ignore it all. I mean- Yeah. He could just say, yeah, we're not going to bother with it anymore. I won my election. Uh, we're not going to bother with this disease anymore. Let's move on. Right. I, I can see that happening. That would be a horrible outcome. Uh, it collapse the healthcare system. You'd have people that won't be able to get, um, say, coronary bypass surgeries because the surgeon's dead <laughs> or because there's such a long wait because you've got to have all these proofs that you don't have the COVID before you go in, vaccine or no. Um, it could be the point where the European Union will have a vaccine and Japan will have a vaccine and China will have a vaccine and the United States will be out in the cold because we've been ignoring it. That would be a horrible outcome. But we would deserve uh, that. Well, you, you got to have some kind of compassion for the ignorant. Uh, people who 
people who have trusted certain leaders to say things and have been misled, they're not trying to do evil. The people who are doing this, who are trusting these leaders, they they think they're doing right. And so you have to have some kind of compassion for them. You don't want people to, and and, and even if you don't have compassion for them, you got to realize that they could affect other people who don't think that way. Um, they can infect the elderly who maybe can't be vaccinated because they're too frail or something. They could infect you know, people who are immunocompromised from other things that can't be vaccinated. Um, a lot of people could die innocently. And then there's a lot of people who we simply need to either educate uh, or, or somehow bring them around to realizing that we're all in this together. The science is clear. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's kind of like smoking. You know, people know the cigarette smoking kills them. Anybody who doubts the cigarette smoking is is a dangerous activity simply has not been listening. It's generally accepted. So, people who doubt that walking around unvaccinated for COVID nineteen would be dangerous, well, it should become the minority. I mean, it's just you need to you need to control this disease. Um, Having said that, a lot of people choose to smoke. Okay. Yeah, but that, that's, smoke. that's not catching. That's yeah, true. It's not. This is, this it, is catching. It, out, yeah. You can forbid them to come into your office space, into your building and smoke. You can forbid them to be within 30 feet of the front door or whatever and smoke. Yeah. yeah. And then it minimizes the risk to everybody else. That has happened and, here. I, I remember when downtown, you know, began to adopt that policy in general, and then the city mm -hmm. adopted mm -hmm. it. But you know, on yeah. the social psychology level, Mike, it seems to me that one of the takeaways from this whole discussion is we're not gonna be able to lick this thing until A, we get the government to take a position on it and the government hasn't yeah. under Trump. Yeah. B, B, we have to educate the people so they're all together. You know, you, you said, yeah. you know, we gotta yeah. be in this all together. And, and that's the same thing that happened in the plague. When, when people, you know, realized that there was a, a problem and that they had to take communal action to deal with it. Only then were they able to beat it back. It's yeah, the same yeah. thing here. It's exactly the same <laughs> thing here. We all have to yeah. be in the same boat. We all have to be in it together. And yeah, until we, we educate same. everyone yeah. and get everybody in the same boat, we're not going to be able to do it. Don't you agree? Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, part of the problem with the 1918 flu, the reason we forgot it so quickly, some sociologists have been reading, you know, speculated the reason we forgot about that pandemic so quickly as horrible as it was is people were ashamed of the way they behaved during the pandemic they were ashamed of their denial ashamed of the death toll that it, it ultimately led to and we're going to have a similar phenomenon with this disease that once we get the vaccine get past this people are going to be so ashamed of how they behave they're going to want to just forget the whole episode and we may well be doomed to repeat this again because of that and this isn't yeah. going to be the last world pandemic. No, no it'll happen it's, again. Yeah. yeah, it will happen Virus again. Special. You know, one thing that strikes me from some of the things you've said is, uh, so a, a person a person gets, you know, COVID and he survives mm -hmm. or she. Sure. And um, <clears throat> that's good. However, um, you know, it, it's, it's become clear in the, in the public conversation that COVID has long, long lasting effects. Even if you're a yeah. long, long yeah. hauler, you know, where you don't show, uh, <laughs> so you, can, you can still have these long lasting uh, effects, like, um, you know, mm -hmm. your acuity, for example, that would be very troublesome. Mm -hmm. And also your vulnerability to other diseases, your, your whole mm -hmm. body is, is weakened yeah. and forever. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. now you go, you go and apply for a job, okay? Um, mm -hmm. say, have you had COVID? Okay, now I yeah. suppose HIPAA would pr prevent you from saying that, um, you know, answering that question. But, but the fact is that if the prospective employer knew that you've had COVID, he would not offer you a job. He'd be concerned well, that, that, about that your... is a problem. I mean, if they can ask you if you had COVID, they can ask you if you ever had cerebral palsy or epilepsy or a whole number of diseases that we now we consider medically private. You can't be denied a job because you have a pre-existing condition as long as you can do the job. Yeah. Now, they may require you to pass a cognitive test to, to get the job. That's normal. You know, not the Google How about a COVID test? Those places, yeah. How about a COVID well, you know, they might require you to take a COVID test, too. I mean, you got to 
that you could, I mean, they might be able to say you should have had a vaccine or you should have proved that you're immune to COVID um, before you can take the job. I mean, they could, they could do that. Yeah. But, um, you you got to, it's kind of, a pre-existing condition can't be used as an excuse alone for losing a job. Um, it, it's got to be relevant to the job. Yeah, that's, that's my insight from what I understood so far about the medical privacy issues. You know, all those things may be changing. COVID, mm. COVID has changed our world in so many ways, and people are so, at least some people are so terrified of it, and others are so ignorant of it. Um, you mm. know, there's this mm. huge disparity of knowledge and appreciation about what it can do. Anyway, so um, what, yeah. what, is, what is your takeaway for everybody? Uh, uh, what, what, you know, what, what do you want them to remember about this conversation on the eve of election day, Mike? Wow, that's, that's a good question. Well, I want everybody to remember that, you know, wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands, take care of the people around you. Um, and we're going to get through this one way or another. The species will survive this. But we have a chance here to decide with the United States of America to stay as a world leader or becomes a world laughing stock. And that's what's at stake in this election. We're gonna be pitied if we make the wrong choice by the world and by history. And we have a chance to become world leaders, the example of shining light again, or to be the laughing stock and the object of pity. Good luck to us. May God bless mm -hmm. us, everyone. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much, Mike DeWert, our chief scientist, discussing the Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Of the day before the election. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Aloha, yeah. Mike.